Thank you, Bob. Good morning, everybody. Good, morning. good to be with you. It's always good to be with Sharon, so I, have, I appreciate this opportunity uh, yesterday and today. I'm going to talk about some simple stuff this morning. And what I mean by that is uh, just the kind of stuff that we all deal with every day when we're trying to follow the Lord Jesus and trying to be good Catholics. And it's uh, sort of like uh, dealing with life as it is. That's what I want to talk about. How do we deal with life as it is? I think probably most of you, uh, like I do, remember the CBS Evening News from many, many years ago when uh, Walter Cronkite was the guy. And if you recall, Walter Cronkite was known as the most trusted man in America. Do you recall that? That was, uh, that was what he was known for, the most trusted man uh, in America. Every evening, at the end of his newscast, he said the same thing. Anybody recall what that was? And that's the way it is. He real close. He said, his last statement was, and that's the way it is. June 29th, 2018, every single night he said the same thing. Well, at that point uh, in history, uh, in, in our relationship with the media, we believed him. That if Walter Cronkite said, that's the way it was, then that's the way it was. I don't know if we would have that same reaction these days. But that is how we reacted back in those days. That's the way it was. Now, it seems to me that in many ways, you and I, when we have frustrations and stressors in life, have those because in a certain sense, we're thinking that life should be different. And so, in a certain sense, we're not satisfied with life the way it is. And so, some of the stressors that we experience in day-to-day in -day life as disciples of the Lord Jesus is because, deep down, we're wishing things were different. And we can't live that way and be at peace. The first thing we have to recognize is that the Lord Jesus came into this world as it is. Not as we wish it would be, uh, not as the, the perfected life of eternity that he came to give to us, but the Lord Jesus came into this world as it is, into our lives as they are. And so if we recognize that, then it gives us a different perspective on the way we are to follow him ourselves. The Lord Jesus came into this world knowing fully life as it is. Do you think the Lord was surprised by what he found when he got here? Uh, no, I don't think so. In fact, he himself said a couple of times, he, you know, he knew human nature quite well. He wasn't surprised. And in fact, because life is the way it is, that's why the Lord came as our Savior. That's the reason. So let's talk a little bit about four simple points I want to make this morning about how all of us are, are called upon to recognize the Lord Jesus' place in our lives as they are. The first simple point is this. In the midst of the stressors that God gives us, I mean, that life gives us every day, very often, a very simple moment of prayerful reflection can help us set the day on a different course. That's going to be my first point. The second thing is related to it. If we offer to God the day as it is, as we're experiencing it, instead of trying to wish it were different or fight it, then we can also find that we'll direct the day away from ourselves and toward God, and that makes a huge difference. The next point is that we're called upon to surrender to God, and I want to talk a few moments about what it means that we're called upon to surrender to God. And then finally, back again to that central point, dealing with life as it is, as disciples of the Lord Jesus. I have a good friend who's a, uh, an orthopedic surgeon in Little Rock, Arkansas. And when I was the Bishop of Little Rock, I always went to the home games of basketball games or football games of the Little, Little Rock Rockets. And they are, and still are, for those of you who are Arkansans back there know that the Rockets are a powerhouse. Isn't that right? Say yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and so every Friday night, particularly during football season, I went to their home games, uh, which took place in War, take place at War Memorial Stadium. My friend, the doctor, and this is during the period in, during which we became friends, was the team doc, and I think he probably still is. So he and I would uh, enjoy the game by the sidelines, and in between injuries, whoops, injuries, 
In between injuries, uh, we would solve the world's problems. <laughs> and so he told me about some things that had happened in his own life as, as a physician and as one who taught uh, at the medical school at the University of Arkansas. And there was one particular incident in his own personal life at home that I've never forgotten. In fact, I liked it so much that I asked his permission to tell this story, and he gave me permission. One day, he uh, came home from the office, and it had not been a good day. So late in the afternoon, apparently when he arrived home, he slammed the door a little bit too hard, and he made his presence known to his family a little too loudly, his eight kids. And just about everything that he did as he came in demonstrated to his wife and his kids that they should stay away. <laughs> so he goes into the kitchen as his wife is preparing supper and he gets a glass because uh, he wants to help set the table and put ice in the glasses. So he gets the glass and he walks up to the refrigerator to the ice dispenser and he puts it in there and no ice comes out. So he tries again, puts it there, no ice comes out. And he says to his wife, What's wrong with this thing? Why don't you get it fixed? So she comes over to him, takes his hand away from the ice dispenser, and pulls it down, and looks him square in the eyes, and says, it's not about the ice, is it? <laughs> and she was exactly right. No, it wasn't about the ice at all. It was about a patient who complained. It was about stuff in the office that had not gone the way he had wanted it to go that day. It was about a feeling of failure that he had had that day for what didn't happen, that he had wanted to happen. It was about a whole bunch of pent up stuff that erupted in front of the Frigidaire when he got home that night. <laughs> but once he told her what the day was like, he understood what was going on in his own head and in his own body. And no, it wasn't about the ice <coughs> at all. Once his true frustrations were on the table, and once his emotions had been soothed by his wife's open ear, he could laugh at himself and all the family could relax. <laughs> and they could enjoy dinner together. I appreciated that story a lot, and the reason I asked his permission to tell it, and I tell it often, is because it's the same with me too. Things can get easily twisted up inside in dealing with life as it has been in a particular day, or life as it is as I'm in the midst of it. And I find that I can go halfway through the day, and there is something like a cloud, something that's nagging at me from within, that is casting a shadow on everything else from the rest of the day. And I get halfway through the day and I say to myself, why, am I, why do I feel this way? What has caused me to feel like there's this shadow following me? And why am I kind of tensed up? I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm a puzzle to myself. <laughs> and I ask myself, why did I say that? Why did I do that? And so likewise, if it's a family member or a coworker who thunders past us, we look at them and we think to ourselves, I wonder what's wrong, what happened, you know? I remember one time when I was a seminarian, uh, and I won't tell you uh, anything more than that. When I, when I was a seminarian, uh, we had our seminarian's retreat, and the bishop came and gave us a talk, my bishop at that time. And uh, he was, you could tell, wound up about something. <laughs> And so when he finished his talk, his, his homily, and when he sat down, the seminarian sitting next to me said, something really bad must have happened. <laughs> because he could feel the emotion that there was something else going on than what was happening right in front of us. I once had a uh, priest in residence with me at the parish in Memphis who was also the uh, principal of the uh, local Catholic high school. And I told him that I could always tell when he had had a bad day because when he came in the garage, he slammed the back door and started cleaning the rectory. <laughs> That's how I knew. We can read people whom we know, can we? We can tell. And even people who we don't know, we can 
we can think for a moment that something has gone or is going on within some place. Apparently, St. Paul had exactly the same experience about himself. As you know, he wrote to the Corinthians about that thorn in the flesh which, with which the Lord had allowed him to be afflicted. And to the Romans, he wrote these famous words that I, in which I find great consolation. What I do, I do not understand. For I do not do what I want, but what I hate. Just like the rest of us, apparently, St. Paul would have preferred to find the off switch to certain struggles within and without. But such a switch did not and does not exist. For at least some unnamed stressors of the day, I have found that there is a simple antidote in prayerful reflection. And for all of those stressors of the day, there is God's response. And it's the same response that he gave to St. Paul. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. I learned a few years ago that when mid-morning or midday, I said a few years ago, many years ago, I learned that when midday or mid-afternoon, there's this shadow cast over me and sort of a, an undefined sense of worry or whatever. If I take just a moment and think back on the day, asking the Lord to enlighten what happened since I woke up, I can almost always pinpoint the moment at which that shadow appeared, almost always. Maybe it was a letter that I got in the mail that just destroyed my peace inside. Maybe it was something that I said to someone that I regretted saying almost immediately or a little bit later. Maybe it was just something in the family, in my own family, about which I was worried. It could have been any number of things. But I do find that if I take some moment in prayerful reflection, when I come to the realization that that shadow is following me around, I can almost always identify it. And then when I'm able to identify it, I can ask God to shed his light on it, which I do, and then I can go through the rest of the day in peace, dealing with life as it is. So that's what I find helps me in the course of a singular day when I found that the stressors of life are kind of piling up on me and within me. But there's also a permanent stance that St. Paul himself learned to take. And it's that of trusting in God's strength for everything and not in our own. And so he said, I rather boast most gladly of my weakness in order that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weakness insults, hardships, persecutions, and constraints for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So let's take a moment, each of us in his or her own heart, and if there's anything at this moment that you left behind perhaps at home, but nonetheless is with you and causing you some worry or some stress, if there's someone in your family for whom you particularly have concern and are praying for today, if there's something that you yourself find is following you around today, let's take for a moment. Let's identify what it or those things are, and let's offer them to God, asking him to shed his light on them.
I've lived in Seattle now for about seven and a half years, and the Archbishop's residence is right smack in the middle of a very busy part of town, just a quarter of a mile from downtown Seattle. In fact, I live directly across the street from the emergency room at a busy hospital. <laughs> and the house was built in 1902, and so it has the original thin panes of glass, and I hear everything that happens in the neighborhood, day and night. My first couple of weeks when I moved in uh, seven and a half years ago, there was this clicking sound that I constantly heard from inside the house. I could not figure out what it was. Clicking all the time, going on, and then there would be a pause and it would happen again. So one day, I was walking to the office, which is only about a half a mile away, and I typically walk every day to the office, and I found out what the clicking noise was. It's those buttons in which you theoretically can make the street lights stop for you so you can cross over as a pedestrian. You know those traffic <laughs> buttons? And so I watched as I neared this particular morning, as I watched the intersection right in front of my house, I saw people going, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> That's what I was hearing. But then for a moment I reflected, now, let's be honest, if you live in a place where you have to deal with those things, don't you push it twice at least. <laughs> it's, you know, it, it's as if it's going to understand that you're in a hurry. <laughs> I did that, and so I resolved that day that I would only push the traffic button one time. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean that with inside, I'm not pushing it about 30 times, <laughs> but I only push it once now. I read an article uh, after, I, uh, after I discovered this, I found an article online that said that precisely for the reasons that I'm mentioning, many cities deactivate those things and make people think that they work, but they don't. <laughs> and so I don't think, truly, I don't think there are many or any functioning traffic buttons in the city of Seattle. We mistreat them pretty badly. <laughs> but I realized that my own habit of pushing the button at least twice was irrational. I stopped doing so, as I said. What I figure is a little less violence to an inanimate object <laughs> and a little less insistence on my presence would do Seattle traffic and myself a lot of good. Years ago, uh, I decided that when flying, I would always sit on the aisle. Now, I, I, I've flown so much that it doesn't hold any fascination for me anymore to sit by the window. Uh, and uh, sitting on the aisle has lots of advantages, as you well know. Sitting on the window, if you have to take a break, you've got to ask one or two people to get up to let you out. But I also quickly decided that the worst is sitting in the middle. For all, isn't it? For all kinds of reasons. It has something to do with the way all of us live in the space that's around us. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether we're a, a big person or a small person. How many times have you been sitting in a particular seat on a plane, and the person next to you, whether it's in, the, no matter where they're sitting, takes up a whole lot more room than physically they have with them. And so it could be because they've got those big headphones on and they're listening to music so loud that even through the headphones, you can hear what they're listening to. Or maybe it's because they fidget so much that uh, they use up their space and your space. When you're sitting in the middle also, how can you figure out which of the armrests are yours? <laughs> Should I use one or both to be like this or whatever? So you realize that maybe even I myself take up more room than I want to or than I should because I'm feeling it all over around me. Therefore, I always sit on the aisle and I let the person next to me have the right armrest if I can until I forget. It does really vary among us how much space we take up on a plane, or how much space we take up in our houses, like my friend the doctor discovered very clearly. Our size doesn't determine it. 
There's a lot uh, these days, especially out where I live, a lot of talk about the one's carbon footprint. You know what that means? Uh, basically, uh, how much energy am I theoretically displacing or using up and harming the environment by the car that I drive, or uh, <coughs> by how many, if I have a private jet, uh, how, how much uh, carbon, of a, of a carbon footprint am I leaving on this earth because of the way I choose to live? <coughs> Using electricity too much, too much air conditioning if you live in the south, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That got me to thinking. I wonder if it might be helpful for, for me personally, and maybe for all of us today, uh, to take a certain kind of examination of how much of an emotional footprint we leave. Forget about carbon. Do I leave an emotional footprint wherever I go? In other words, the effect that I have on other people by the bluster of my personal moods, the amount of personal space I take up to which I'm oblivious, but to which the other people have to accommodate in their own situation right next to me. The volume and the pitch of, our, of my opinions and my complaints and the weight that we give to our very presence. I have a feeling that if we took stock of that emotional footprint that each of us has, that each of us leaves when we walk out of a room, we might back off a little bit of a number of things. In fact, I think taking a, an inventory of our personal emotional footprint could be a good exercise for today. As the Cardinal and the other bishops uh, here know that uh, only bishops, when we begin the liturgy, say, peace be with you. Every liturgy, that's, that's how we begin. And that's become for me personally kind of a, a personal uh, examination of conscience. And what I mean by that is this. As a bishop, as the Lord who announced to his disciples peace after he had risen from the dead, in other words, the peace that he had promised to give, perfect reconciliation between us and his heavenly father by his death and resurrection, that we bishops always have the privilege of announcing at the beginning of the liturgy, peace be with you. That's really, kind of should be a personal anthem for us bishops. And so I ask myself, when I enter a room, does my presence announce peace? Or when I enter a room, am I a presence to contend with. He's here. <laughs> I tell folks that uh, whenever a bishop shows up unexpectedly at a parish for a mass on Sunday, there, there are two reactions. One is, oh, that's great, the bishop's here. And the other one is, oh no, the bishop's here. <laughs> so I find that that liturgical privilege that I have at the beginning of every liturgy of announcing the Lord's peace is a good way for me to take a personal inventory about myself. When people see me and the way that I live, do I announce by my life the peace of Christ? A couple of simple questions. Let's just take some quiet time for reflection. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pose them slowly. How often do I make the world around me revolve around me? With those with whom I live and work, if I gave them the opportunity to speak freely, say that I am a force to contend with, a physical and emotional presence not easily accommodated. Do I say loudly things that would be better said softly? Do 
I speak when silence would be more appropriate and more welcome? Do I ever sap the energy and mood from a room just by my bad-tempered attitude? Do I ever hang up the phone harshly, slam the door excessively, push the traffic signal button too many times? <laughs> I find that when asking myself those simple little questions and a number of others that are related to those, not only does my own mood lighten, but probably the mood of the room in which I am lightens as well. But why is such an inventory appropriate for us today, but in our day-to-day -day lives, lives as they are? St. James gives us a good way to look at it. He says this. If anyone does not fall short in speech, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body also. If we put into the mouths of horses the bits to make them obey us, we also guide their whole bodies. It's the same with ships. Even though they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are steered by a very small rudder whenever the pilot's inclination wishes. In the same way, the tongue is a small member and yet has great pretensions. Consider how small a fire can set huge forests ablaze. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show his works by a good life in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. Wisdom of this kind does not come down from above, but is earthly unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every foul practice. But the wisdom that comes from above is first of all pure, then peaceable, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, without inconstancy or insincerity. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace for those who cultivate peace. So maybe this morning, all of us can resolve to leave a smaller emotional footprint and to cultivate peace. Peace in our homes, peace in our parishes, peace in our rectories, peace on the streets, peace in our hearts. But not our peace, the peace of Christ. There's a venerated practice among Catholics of making a morning offering, and uh, we priests know that, that many uh, rectories around the world, I think probably everyone I've ever lived in, including the house where I have now, has the morning office taped or somehow affixed to the, to the bathroom mirror, uh, which is, which is uh, it's always been that way for me, and I have one in, in actually in the, the Archbishop's residence. As I said at the very beginning, uh, Offering life as it is today to God in a prayer such as the morning offering is a way of drawing the attention away from me where it would otherwise stay if I didn't examine it a bit and instead giving it to God. Away from me, because that's what I'm going to get torn up if I concentrate it only on myself. But the morning offering gives me an opportunity to surrender it to God. But what does surrender mean? It's one of the key spiritual goals that all of us should have as followers of the Lord Jesus. But what does it mean to surrender? 
some years ago, uh, soon after I moved up to Illinois, in a conversation with some young people, uh, I used the word, I used the term, cry uncle. Now, do you guys know what that means? No, okay. In that conversation, they, the, the people I was having with looked at me like I had come from another planet. <laughs> what does that mean, to cry uncle? Well, you know, it, it means uh, I give up. And we can cry uncle, whether it's an arm wrestling match, or whether it's a ping pong match, or an argument, whatever it might be. When, when you say, you know, I, I, okay, that's, you know, I, I tell you, tell me. What, what, what I, I cry uncle, you tell me, uncle. And we all know what that means. Tell me. In the same way, to use the word surrender uh, can sound a little bit like crying uncle when it's really nothing of the sort when it comes to our spiritual lives. In fact, we use that word in a whole bunch of different ways in the English language. It can mean that we stop fighting because we realize we're not going to win. It means that we might, in some cases, give up possession of something. In other words, uh, even something that's ours. So if, uh, if a guy comes up to you with a gun and says, give me your wallet, we surrender our wallet to him. Something that's ours, we give it up. It may mean that we give up a particular idea or a desire that we have. So we might say something like, uh, uh, I gave up after my surgery, I gave up the idea that I could ever hike the Appalachian Trail. I surrendered the idea that I could ever do that. It may mean that we yield a very strong emotion or an influence or a temptation. He surrendered to his grief and wept bitterly. It could also mean that we abandon our rights to something. So for example, she surrendered her lease to the apartment though she had already paid three months rent in advance. Surrender. By and large, we assume that at least implicitly, all of the phrases that I've just used imply that someone other than I, something other than my goal, has won. And that means I have lost, and no one likes to lose. But Christian faith evokes another sense of surrender, and in fact, instills it with hope. It's a good thing. It's a salutary thing for our spiritual health. It'd be helpful to explore, I think, just for a couple of minutes this morning, one aspect of surrender as it, as it relates to our spiritual lives. The Catechism defines sin this way. Sin is an offense against God as well as a fault against reason, truth, and right conscience. Sin is a deliberate thought, word, deed, or omission contrary to the eternal law of God. We all know that when we're tempted, there's a temporary war that's waged inside of us. Temptation creates tension and dissonance within us because we instinctively recognize that something significant is at stake. But there's some things we always have to remember about temptation. First of all, the devil uses temptation as a way of making bad appear to look good. So it's a masquerade. Temptation is a masquerade. When evil masquerades as good. But the thing about temptation is that temptation can never deliver what it seems to promise. That's the deal, and we have to remember that. Temptation can never deliver what it seems to promise. So the question when we realize that within we're battling that temptation, that war is waging on within us, is this. Will I give in to the temptation? Will I let it overpower me? Will I cry uncle? Lay down my defenses and let myself be defeated. Will I sin? Sin is surrender to the deceptive wiles of the enemy, the devil. And that is defeat. Repentance is surrender to the faithful love of the friend, God. And that is victory. Surrender to God is always victory. 
when we've sinned and we have that healthy sense of guilt, which in other words is a sign that we know we did wrong and we didn't want to do wrong, we feel that dissonance within, which we refer to as guilt. Do you know why we feel that way? We feel that dissonance inside because we were not made for evil. We were not made for sin. Sin is against God's original plan for us all. And so we feel that incident, that dissonance inside because we were made for good. Sin is beneath us as sons and daughters of God. Temptation promises what it can never deliver. The promises of Jesus are true and honest because the Lord Jesus always delivers what he promises. Repentance is surrender to the faithful love of the friend, God. And that is always victory. The good news of Christianity is that sin, the sin of Adam and Eve and our own personal sin, is never the final verdict on our lives. Sin has not won, and God has not been defeated. To the contrary, on the cross, Jesus gave us his life as a sacrifice of atonement and reparation for our sins and the sins of the whole world of all time, once for all. He made amends for our sinful disobedience and reconciled us with his heavenly Father. And that's why he pronounced the apostles in the upper room, peace. By his selfless obedience and love, he was victorious over sin and its most horrific damage, death. And through faith and baptism, he then extends his victory to all of us. Repentance is surrender to the faithful love of the friend, God. And that is victory. A little book that's called In Mercy, I'm sorry, In Mercy, Mercy and Weakness. There's a Cistercian abbot by the name of Andre Luf who writes something very beautiful and very simple. He said, it's not the person who knows and is able to do things, who judges and condemns, who practices his faith. In the act of believing, a human being yields and surrenders, lowers his arms and drops his weapons. With his whole body and all his possessions, he delivers himself up to love. That is surrender. And that is not defeat. And we have lost nothing. We have gained everything when we surrender to God. God's unsurpassed love and patience and mercy teaches us that it's always too early to give up. It is never too late to start again. It is always time to surrender to God. Back in the, same, in the seventh century, uh, St. John Climacus wrote a wonderful work that I go back to every Lent called The Ladder of Divine Ascent. And uh, he, he, he describes the spiritual life as a ladder with a number of steps that we climb as we ascend toward God in the spiritual life. My favorite of the chapters is the chapter on repentance. And here's what he says about repentance. Repentance is the daughter of hope and the refusal to despair. What a beautiful way to think about repentance. Repentance is the daughter of hope and the refusal to despair. One of my sisters and brothers-in-law live in, uh, in Arkansas and my brother-in-law is a, uh, a surgeon in their little town, a general surgeon. Their kids are all grown now, and they're enjoying spending time with the grandkids, and uh, so they, they, they have a little more time, not a whole lot more time, but a little more time uh, for some of the kind of reading and activities and volunteer work that they like to do around their little town and their church. Not long ago when I went over to visit them and have supper at their house, uh, my brother-in-law told me that he was taking up reading for pleasure again. And one of his particular interests is philosophy. So he told me that that week he had gone to a bookstore in Batesville, Arkansas, and uh, he found a book on philosophy in this bookstore. And so he thought, 
this was the book he should read. And he took it up to the cashier and he gave it to her and she rang it up and he told him that will be $77. <laughs> and so my brother-in-law said to her, is it too late to take it back? <laughs> and she says, no, she let, him, she let him take it back to the shelf. Instead, he found another little book for $7. <laughs> also a philosophy book. And that was the book that was in front of me on the kitchen table the night that I went over there for supper. And my brother-in-law says to me, Peter, did you know that St. Francis of Assisi wrote the serenity prayer? <laughs> that was in his philosophy book. And I said, I don't think so. He said, in fact, uh, St. Francis is attributed with some other stuff that he never said or wrote. Like, for example, the, the blessing from the Book of Numbers that is attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. He would not agree. He did not write that book or that prayer. So we talked a little bit about the serenity prayer, my brother-in-law, Steve, and I, and how beautiful it is. And I asked him if he, if he had ever read the entire serenity prayer. Uh, it's written by a, a 20th century a Protestant philosopher, theologian by the name of Reinhold Niebuhr. The portion of the prayer that most of us are familiar with is just the beginning of the prayer. And it's, uh, as you know, it's also the wonderful prayer that Alcoholics Anonymous uh, adopted many, many years ago when Bill started Alcohol Alcoholics Anonymous. But it's actually less than half the prayer. I promised uh, my brother-in-law after supper that night that when I got back home, I would email him the full prayer. And I thought, praying the whole prayer with you uh, might be a good way to end my time with you this morning. So this is the serenity prayer by Reinhold Niebuhr. God, give us grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed. Courage to change the things which should be changed, and the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other, <coughs> living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. His name is John Clemacus, C-L-I-M-A-C-U-S. And you can find that easily on, uh, on Amazon, which is in Seattle, Washington, by the way. <laughs> and we're almost as proud of that as we are of the Sarah Club. Yes? Could you tell us, a repeat, just a little bit about your <laughs> You know, actually, my, the real version that I had was like 45 minutes long, so I, I, I'd be happy to give that version now. <laughs> I, uh, essentially, I talked about two kind of heroes in my life who helped me discern a vocation to the priesthood. One was my aunt, Sister Camille, uh, who was a National Dominican, uh, as my sister is, and the other was Father Pat Lynch, who was a priest of the Diocese of Nashville and then the, the Diocese of Memphis. And how they gave themselves to God was an inspiration to me in order to understand uh, how God was calling me. And I, I simply uh, ask the Sarans to, to keep in mind that uh, what all of us are called to do as Sarans is to create an atmosphere back in, in our families, but also in the archdiocese, the archdiocese is where we live, where it's the most natural thing in the world 
to consider a vocation to the priesthood or religious life. And we can do that by our own attitudes and the way we pray. Not by talking about things as a crisis, because that, who wants to come to a crisis? Uh, but, but to the contrary, just making it to seem, make it, because that's what it is, and that's what it was in my life, the most natural thing in the world to consider a vocation to the priesthood or religious life. Frankly, I'm finding uh, in our diocese, as it was in, in Little Rock and Joliet, that really, is, that's, that's happening. Young people really are beginning to understand that that's the case. So that was, that was in a nutshell. Maybe I should have just talked that quickly last night. <laughs> Anybody, anybody else? Question? Uh, question with the archbishop? Looks like there's one more.